When people say, what was the movie where you used everything you ever learned as a makeup artist? The Hunger Games. On those four movies, we, we did every single thing that a makeup artist has ever learned in their entire career. I mean, you know, from like decapitated people to cat people to, you know, a high fashion beauty makeups. We had, you know, we were working with amputees when we did the whole war scenes. We had, I, I mean, it was just everything. You know, we had whip, we had, you know, I whipped Gail for the scenes at the whipping post. That was like this big old whip makeup I did on him for like about a week long. And I mean, there was just, and just, you just, I, I mean, there was so much stuff going on in those movies that there was, we did everything. So that was kind of fun. Make some noise for the incredible V. Neal, the legendary. Well, nice welcome. Thank you very much. This is definitely my first time and probably my only time sharing the stage with a three-time Academy Award winner. I am uh, such a fan of so many of the projects you've worked on. Who, that, you know, who were you a fan of that inspired you to pursue a career in makeup? Well, you know, I used to watch all the old Universal horror films, so I guess Jack Pierce was the first makeup artist that I ever knew anything about, but I didn't really even know who he was, you know, because nobody ever told girls who did makeup, you know. So it wasn't one of those kind of things. I just knew that I always wanted to do it as a child. and So I suppose from watching all those old Universal horror films, that's what really inspired me to become a makeup artist. Very cool, very cool. So again, I do want to reiterate that uh, this is your guys' panel. I see a packed house, so as soon as I see hands going up, I'm happy to call out for audience questions. I also know it takes a little time for the room to warm up, so I have plenty here uh, while, that, while you guys warm up there. Um, being that we're at Horicon, I have to ask about Tourist Trap. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this thing, is this good? Am I oh, this is watching. I'll pull it probably a me? little bit closer there. Is this better? I don't want to blast you out of the room. I think that's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what would you like to know about Tourist Trap? What <laughs> that was is, a long time ago. What is your favorite memory of doing Tourist Trap? Um, I don't think I can say that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nope, can't talk about that. Nope, let's see. Um, I think the coolest thing was like meeting Chuck Connors because as a child I used to watch him on The Rifleman, so it was like, oh my God. And he is so big and so imposing. But he was really nice to work with. He was a nice guy. And then, of course, there was Tanya Roberts who wound up being, what was she, not Xena, who was she? Um, what's Tanya Roberts? Uh, she wound up being like Xena or Queen of the Jungle or one of something those. Something like that, but not Xena, like yeah. Xena adjacent or, something, yeah. Something, I don't remember, but she, but you know, and Charlie's Angels, yeah, she did that as well, yeah, so she was kind of, you know, she was our built-in Barbie doll on that show. But it, what was so fun about that movie, was like probably one of my very first films, and I did that with Steve Neal, and we made like all the masks for all the, you know, the mannequins in the, um, in the uh, little, that thing he had, the ones that would like turn on and stuff. And that was our next door neighbor. His name was Billy Scudder. And Billy actually was the guy who did a million years ago. You probably don't know, but there used to be these Apple commercials with Charlie Chaplin in them. And he was the guy who played Charlie Chaplin. So he was in those commercials for years, but he was all of those mannequins. Each one of those guys was his face just with a different makeup or mustache or whatever. He was a different character in every one, and that was really fun. And then, of course, we did that weird little doll thing with the, oh, so creepy. Anyway. <laughs> so I grew up in a house with literally closets full of Star Trek VHS tapes, so of course I have to ask about Star Trek The Motion Picture. That was really cool. That was my first really big, well, that was my first big union movie, and... It was amazing because I had um, sort of befriended Fred Phillips, who was the makeup artist on the original Star Trek TV show. And I had met him at Star Trek conventions. And uh, the gentleman that I was working with, Steve Neal, he and I would get jobs on these nine unit pictures. We'd always call Fred up and say, hey, Fred, can you go put this makeup on that we made? Because it was a union job and we couldn't go do it. So he would go and put the makeups on and we would make them. So anyway, you know, we stayed friends. He was kind of my, like my mentor. And he called me up one day and he said, hey, V, he said, um, you know, they're going to be making a start. He, you know, he says, you've worked with Bill Shatner before, haven't you? And I said, oh, yeah, I did this really crappy little movie with him called Kingdom of the Spiders. <laughs> and so he said, well, yeah, he says, OK, he says, oh, that's great. He said, he says, you know, he says, they're going to be making a Star Trek movie. Do you think you'd want to come work on that with me? And I went, 
what? I like my like my whole body was like jumping up and down. I'm going, what? Yes, of course I want to come work with you on that. So that was my first big union job with Fred, and um, I went and did Bill, and I did Stephen Collins for a while, and and uh, Fred's daughter Jana was there. She did Persis, the bald gal, Persis Kambata, and then. Um, Fred would do Leonard's makeup, but Fred was starting to lose his eyesight, so he would have me watch Leonard. I also did the guy on the bridge with the big brain. And he would have me watch Leonard on the set because he wanted to make sure that somebody was taking care of him, so I would just keep Leonard's makeup up once we got to the set. But it was really kind of a neat experience. I mean, it was a huge movie with, like, lots of money. We had every stage on the Paramount lot, pretty much, except for the ones where they did the three camera shows that were like permanent you know, stages that they used. But when it came time to doing, I think when we had to go do the set for the Klingons, they had to, we had to shut down for a while because they had to tear apart one of the stages because they didn't have any more stages to build on. So they had to shut down for a minute to do that. So what we did during that period was, Fred had me put all of the Klingons together so what I did was the guys were making the heads, and they were, they were urethane heads back then that you could blend in, you know, for what it was worth. <laughs> and um, so I put all the heads together, and I colored them, and then I laid all the hair on them and put, you know, I gave, gave each one of the Klingons an individual design. I dressed all the hair pieces, so when the, and I did all the test makeups on every single one of them. I think originally there was like 13 of them. Or there couldn't have been 13 of them, could there? Maybe nine of them. I can't remember. There was a lot of them. So I, I did all the test makeups on all those guys while we were waiting to do stuff because there was nothing else to do. So I did that, put them all together. They looked all really bitching. And when it came time to making them up on those days, um, I, you know, Fred had hired all the makeup artists, and I said, I said, Fred, are they going to do what I tell them to do, or are they just going to ignore me because I'm a girl? And he goes. I don't know, B. He says, just go back there and do what you're going to do, and we'll see what happens. And I said, okay. So I put all the heads at each one of the makeup artist stations with all their hair pieces. All they had to do was put the damn head on and stick the hair pieces that blended right into them. But no, these nasty old farts brushed out all the hair on the heads, brushed out all the hair on the hair pieces, and they just had them like they were going through a wind tunnel. And it was like, what? I probably shouldn't be talking about these guys. <laughs> Anyways, probably half of them are dead now. But, um, you know, I, I was such a bummer. So I wound up doing Mark Leonard, who was the lead Klingon, and um, Tom Morga, who was the guy that was right next to him, talking to him, doing the wee jaw and all that whole thing. And um, I did one other guy. And then the other, the other few makeup artists that were there did two Klingons apiece. And... One by one, all of these guys that had been done by another makeup artist came up to me. They said, V, they ruined my makeup. Can you fix it? And I go, no. No, I can't touch anybody else's work. No, I'm not doing that. I'm already probably going to be in hot water because they're all... Because, you know, back then, you guys, there was no female makeup artists. And there were certainly none that were doing makeup effects, you know. And most of those guys barely knew how to do makeup effects. They probably put on some planet of the apes makeups at that point you know on something and just did a schlock job on those too because they didn't really care you know i mean i really cared i wanted everything to look really good so anyways well another, that's my story about star trek boy i went off on a tangent i, I am love so it. sorry yeah. no do not apologize <laughs> that's incredible um so another thing that always looked incredible and it's just a perfect one of the most perfect tv shows of all time have to ask about the a-team oh my god i loved working on the a-team <sighs> What was so great about that was the fact that we were never inside, so we didn't get locked up on a stage. We were always outside. George Papard went home at 5 o'clock every day, and I did George. <laughs> um, but I got to do all of his disguises. But for the first season, I was not doing George, but then his makeup artist went away. And you know what I loved about this thing is, like, all the UPM and everybody are looking, they're talking to each other, and they're going... Well, who should we hire? Hey, the, who, who do you know that blah, blah, blah? The, and they're, all they were talking about was men coming in to replace them. And I said, excuse me, guys. I said, you got the best person for the job standing right in front of you. I said, let me be the department head. Let me do George. And they went, oh, yeah. Because they forgot that I did the pilot, right? They, and then they just started hiring men because that's what everybody was used to was having male. And it was like a male-driven show and everything else. And... So I stayed there for the next three seasons and did George, and 
had a ball, and we got to do all kinds of kooky characters on him, and it was really fun. Oh, and my we, God. we probably killed a million people, and I don't think I ever used one drop of blood on the entire show. Wow. <laughs> we were blowing trucks up and shooting things, and it was like crazy. It was it's fun. It's unbelievable that that was television. Yeah. It's, even in the 80s or any time, like, that's... Uh, every every episode looks like it has a film budget. I yeah, love the idea. It was 18. fun, and that you know what's funny is like we worked with all the stuntmen, and the stuntmen would rotate. There was also another show called Airwolf that was very popular back then. So we would have, we'd say who's coming today, and they go, oh no, they're on Airwolf, and we all shot out at Indian Dunes, which was out in the middle of BF nowhere, out in the, way out in the Santa Clarita Valley, and um, that's also where they shot uh, uh, the Twilight Zone, where they had that terrible episode of Big Moral happened there. But that's where we all shot, was out in that area there. And they used it for everything. For Vietnam, they used it, you know, for whatever it was. And it was always, like, weird villages with strange-looking people in them and, you know, whatever you were going to do. I mean, I think the only time we went on location was we did a thing where we went up the Sacramento River and they were supposed to be in the Amazon. <laughs> so, Sacramento River, a.k.a. Amazon. Yes. <laughs> well, that's TV magic for yeah, you there. TV 1980s magic. TV that's right. magic. So, it was uh, a fun show. Oh, I, I, I'm so, I, that makes me so happy to hear because I love really that cool. show. I still watch it almost every day on TV. No. And if you oh like goodness. one episode, you like every episode of that show. Very few shows fit that bill. I, I also did Dwight Schultz, who was my favorite character in the show. And he was so kooky. And that guy was such an incredible actor. But because he was sort of like the comic relief, he never really got to do anything. But he could do everything from Shakespeare to, I mean comedy the guy was amazing and he never really went anywhere as far as his acting career which was kind of sad i mean i think the only ever the thing i saw him on was like he was in fat boy and little man you know about the okay. atomic bomb um i think he played uh oppenheimer actually wow yeah and he was really good in it but it's like i don't think anybody even recognized him because he was like a normal kind of character he wasn't acting goofy and everything you yeah know? Oh, How man. many of you guys have even seen that TV show? 18? Yeah, raise a show of hands here. Oh, all right, yeah, almost, almost the whole room, what we're right? We're talking about. All right. Okay, cool. Maybe all you youngins don't know what it is. <laughs> so uh, I'll do one more because we're on the topic of the '80s magic right now. Um, I have to ask about the Lost Boys, of course. That's '80s magic right there. Yes, that was it is. One of my yeah, right. Shows. That's what probably like for the longest time when people said, "What was the most fun movie you ever worked on?" I said, "The Lost Boys," because it was without a doubt. So much fun. And Joel Schumacher, who I absolutely adore. I had done a me movie previously with him called The Incredible Shrinking Woman with Lily Tomlin. So, you know, Joel asked me, and I, I don't know, did I already do Flatliners? Did Flatliners come before or after? That was uh, like 90 or 91, I think, so Flatliners. That must have been afterwards. But yeah, the, the Lost Boys was so much. We shot that up in Santa Cruz, and oh my God, it was so much fun. We just had a ball. I mean, we'd shoot all night, and I'd get up and go antiquing all morning before work, and then like hightail it back to the hotel to get on the bus to go to set. And it was just, it was just so much fun. And the boys were fun. The cute, the the Corys were adorable, and it was just a pleasure to go to work every day. You know, it was that, just fun. That is like everything I want to hear. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I do want to let the audience give them another chance to jump back in, guys. I know we got a packed house here. Okay, still a little shy. It happens. Here we go. Who's got a question? Hi. Yes. Well, I've known Paul since the early 70s. In fact, when this is how I met Paul, I was working on the film 9 to 5 with Lily Tomlin. The camera operator on that show happened to be the producer of this wacky show that was just going to be starting to debut at the Roxy Theater. They were like running it for to get people to come in and give them money to do the show. And he said to me, he said, hey, he said, can you come help me on Friday night? I'm doing a, a midnight show with these guys and they could really use your help with makeup. And I went, you're asking me after all week long to go work on a Friday night at midnight? And I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> I thought, well, what kind of a weird show is this, right? And I get there, and um, he said, okay, so only you go help the Miss Vaughn character and the genie guy, you know, go help the zombie character with his makeup, and, and, um, and the, the PB guy doesn't need your help. He does his own makeup. He's fine. And I looked at him, and I went, okay, terrible. 
It was like, you know, white makeup and pink chinks and bad red lipstick and stuff and just goofy looking. And so I thought, okay, fine. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this show and I'm saying, this is the nastiest thing I've ever seen. I, <laughs> who is going to be, where are they going to put this? I mean, it was very body. It was like rude. And there was like a lot of dirty jokes. And, and I said, this is, they're not going to be able to show this to kids, obviously, but it was supposed to be like a kid's show for adults, you know? And so I watched the whole thing and I went back to talk to everybody afterwards. And Paul came up to me and he said, he says, hey, thanks for helping us out and doing all this stuff. And he said, how'd you like the show? And I said, well, <laughs> I said it was, it was kind of a little rude and funky. And he goes, yeah, I know. He says, we're going to clean it up a little bit. And I went, and I said, and he says, and what'd you think of the PB character? And I go, I said, you, uh, uh, <laughs> and I said, well, your voice is like, fingernails on a chalkboard to me <laughs> and I said I really had a hard time listening to you You like really made me kind of crazy and he went okay noted <laughs> and I said but other than that I think you're as funny as hell <laughs> but, but I mean I was just like I couldn't get used to that character so cut to the fact Paul and I hit it off like that and we have been friends ever since then in fact we were just finishing up his his um uh, documentary on his life and he was supposed to go in for one more week of shooting and he passed away the week before we did that and um, that was a very difficult week for me because Paul and I have been very close since the 70s we've been you know very steadfast friends I mean we you know FaceTime every week and stuff so um, that was really a rough week for me but he was an amazing guy extremely talented um, fun to work with I mean you know like I didn't even answer your question. I'm so sorry. I got all melancholy on myself. Um, but Paul was amazing to work with. I mean, there was like so many fun things. Like when we did the Christmas special, oh my God, that was so much fun with all those people. I mean, we had everybody from Grace Jones to Magic Johnson and Cher. Um, Dinah Shore, Cher, Dolly. I mean, everybody was on the special. It was so much fun to have all these celebrities. But I mean, it was like such a you know, vast array of people, you know, he knew everybody everywhere and everybody loved him and it was, it was amazing. You're welcome. He was a cool guy. He really was a cool guy. Great question too. Um, I'm going to let the audience jump in there again. Got some questions up here. Okay. Go you and then after. Um, she was asking me how it was working on Edward Scissorhands. It was really hot. <laughs> we shot that in Florida, and we were trying to keep Johnny cool most of the time just so he wouldn't, like, lose his makeup because it was so bloody hot. You know, if he was, he was either wearing a plastic suit or, you know, shirts with, you know, stuff. So we, at one point, when he wore the plastic suit, we had a thing underneath his suit called a cool suit which was very hard to get underneath there because it was so tiny and tight, the suit, so we had to do like portions of it. They made pieces of it so we could have one up his back and stuff, but we always had big fans blowing on him because it was very hot there. But it was really a fun movie to shoot. I had a blast working on it. And that was like probably, <clears throat> well, that was my first movie with Johnny. And he was like a kid. I mean, he was still under contract with 21 Jump Street when we did that movie. And I think I think he got off. I, in fact, I know he got out of his contract for Twenty One Jump Street when we did that film because he was really excited about it. You know, he, he was dating Winona at the time, so love was in the air and everybody was happy. Wow. <laughs> it was fun. It was really a cool movie to work on. Wow. And then there was a question up here as well. She was asking me what my favorite movie and prosthetics was to do, and I don't have one because that's like asking who's your favorite child. So um, I kind of, you know, a lot of, I did so many iconic fun movies to do with like lots of prosthetics, and some didn't have prosthetics, but I mean, everyone had its own charm and fun, and you know, was, there's, I've just been so uh, fortunate to work on so many cool movies that I really couldn't pick one out because each one of them has like an incredible memory for me, you know, like some fun thing happened, you know? So, you're welcome. Well, if I could piggyback on that one, since you mentioned Winona, it would seem criminal to not ask about Beetlejuice, which of course you won your first Academy Award for. 
Yeah, that was, yeah, of course, Beetlejuice was fabulous. And you know, it's funny, people are always asking about that. And, and we were like the redheaded stepchildren of Warner Brothers. They, we weren't even a Warner Brothers film. We were a David Geffen movie. And they didn't even let us shoot on the lot at Warner Brothers. They put us on a little lot over at the other end of town in Culver City called the Culver City Studios at that time. And it was a tiny little studio, but I remember going into the production trailer and it was like an old construction trailer. It was nasty and you know, they were in these little rinky little desks and shit in this like office. It was so crappy. And it was just, you know, sitting off to the side on the on the lot somewhere. And um the first time I met Tim Burton, I walked into his office and he looked like he was about 19 and he had this rumpled up white shirt on and his hair was all, you know, jacked up all over the place. And I went, wow, this is what directors look like now. All right. <laughs> but um, he was fun. He was really cool. So it, I have a lot of really good memories from Beetlejuice. And all that. That's awesome. So I want to give the audience another chance to jump in since we have such a packed house right here. Okay. And then you next. Sorry. Where am I going? Right here. Oh, over here. Um, I remember watching the TikTok, like, every episode religiously. What was that one thing that you kind of like, wow, you sat there and just really made it all happen? Favorite makeup? She was asking me what the one makeup from Face Off was. I went, wow. But there were so many of them because I couldn't believe what they could get done in three days. I mean, I would just, I was blown away. I mean, there was like this one guy, um, built this robot character that was kind of like a, a, a fireman kind of, I, I, don't, I don't remember what it was. That was really cool. One of my favorite episodes was the Tim Burton episode. You know, the girl with the cello, and then of course the guy who put the bra on my head. That was fucking hysterical, pardon my French. But that was really fun. But there was there were so many. I mean, there was this, uh, What's, what was the blonde girl's name that was sort of towards the end? She was so good. She did some amazing... There was just so many really cool makeups that I just couldn't believe that, they, you know, you give them like this and they do this. Yeah. It's like, how how did they do that? You know what I mean? How And it's like, people used to say to me, um, <clears throat> or like I would be doing interviews and they would say, what's your... What's your the, what are you afraid of most because of what's coming out of Face Off? And I said, what I'm afraid of most is that a producer is going to actually think that you can make one of these things in three days. Because when they see it on TV and they think, well, if they can do it in three days, why can't you? They don't realize that the minute that thing's off camera, it just goes, it falls apart. You know, it just, or it's like, you, we don't show you the bad edges. We don't show you how crappy it really is or how it's stuck together or how they're, they put it on or, you know, what looks underneath and how did they do that? So... It's like, that was my main fear that they really thought that that could happen. I mean, some of these guys did make the makeups that really stayed together, but it was like sheer fortitude and they had help and they just all sort of got together and like, you know, helped each other get it done, you know. But yeah, it was, it was cool. There was a lot of really good work. And I still know a lot of the makeup artists that were on the show. And some of them have schools, some of them have whole companies where they're making stuff. And I mean, it's really amazing the amount of really incredible artists that came out of that show, and I'm, I'm very proud of all of them. So there was another question right over here. Most challenging creations. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of challenges. It, de it depends on the film, like, is it going to be wet there? So it's a challenge just to keep it on them. Like Pirates was a challenge because there were so many of them. We had hair pieces and we were always wet and we were always in the sun and everybody was always getting burnt up. And it was like, you know, that was a challenge just to keep everything on those guys and keep them looking great. Um, Mrs. Doubtfire was a challenge. I did that makeup on Robin 54 times and I had to have it in exactly the same place every day because if I didn't and he started sweating little bubbles of sweat would start popping out and then I'd be chasing it all day long. So I had to make sure that all those pieces overlapped and were in exactly the same place. And I'm, we're talking like centimeters off. It couldn't be centimeters off. So that was a challenge. But what, was it hard to do? No, but it was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So, uh, so more audience questions right now? The packed house. Get so quiet. There we go. Hi. Is there like a genre or a type of character or monster or effect that you haven't ever done that you've seen in other things and I'm like, oh, I would love to do that. 
Uh, no, you know why? Because I've pretty much done a little bit of everything. And I, I'm, I'm kind of fortunate to have had a career where I had like such a wide range of stuff. It's like when people say, what was the movie where you used everything you ever learned as a makeup artist? The Hunger Games. On those four movies, we, we did every single thing that a makeup artist has ever learned in their entire career. I mean, you know, from like decapitated people to cat people to, you know, a high fashion beauty makeups. We had, you know, we were working with amputees when we did the whole war scenes. We had, I, I mean, it was just everything. You know, we had whipped, we had, you know, I whipped Gail for the scenes at the whipping post. That was like this big old whip makeup I did on him for like about a week long. And I mean, there was just, and just, you just, I, I mean, there was so much stuff going on in those movies that there was, we did everything. So that was kind of fun. So I don't know. I think I've done zombies. I've done lizard people. I've done, I don't know what else I could do. You know, I did lizard. I did uh, Reese Ifens as the lizard on uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. And then Sony decided to CGI over all my makeup, the assholes. And then, um, but I mean, I pretty much have gotten to do just about everything I'd really want to do. Well, and I did a cool lizard guy on Galaxy Quest, and I got to work with Alan Rickman. And, love I Galaxy mean, Quest. Oh, my God. Yeah. Such so, a great movie. <clears throat> so another, I mean, literally, you could just take one film in particular where it's like you've done everything, and it's Dick Tracy. Like, there's everything in that movie. Yeah, there was so, a lot he, of stuff in Dick Tracy. I only did Al Pacino for Dick Tracy, so I pretty much did, I mean, there was very few days where he didn't work. When he didn't work on those days, I would probably go and work in background and do some cool makeups there, because we got to... We literally had bags and walls of noses and cheeks and chins and brows, and we could make anything up we wanted to. So it was just fun. We'd just say mix and match to go, oh, here, this is what this guy's wearing. This is what his hair looks like. Go pick out, have fun, make a makeup. So I would do it, and it was fun. We just, you know, because there was like seven makeup artists on that show because of all the main characters we had. Oh, wow, that's so cool. That's so so fun. It was awesome. fun. Very cool. Let the audience jump back in. Okay, up here. I just opened a makeup school in California. Well, we have the I am teaching it right now. Right now, they're they're pretty small classes because I'm teaching basically to uh, makeup artists that are like inter, higher intermediate to professionals. Like I just came back. The um, for instance, I'm in local 706 on the West Coast, and I just got a call from the educational department for local 798 for New York and Atlanta, and they hired me and had me come out and teach their members how to do trauma makeups with prosthetics. So that's pretty cool that you know they hired, and I'm because like you guys don't have any good people back there that could have done that. You want me? Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> so that was really fun. So that was cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm because I, I basically retired from doing film because I don't want to get up at three o'clock in the morning anymore. So, but I still want to do makeup. So I figured, well, the best way to do that would be to you know give back to the community and teach, you know, all my colleagues and friends and new people coming up how to do it my way. You know, and you know, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah right. So if anybody's interested, it's called Legends Makeup Academy, and we are in California in the Los Angeles area, and all of my classes are can be done in one-week pods. You don't have to take a whole bunch of classes. You can come and just take one class. If you want to learn how to lay hair, you can take that class. If you want to learn how to make mustaches and beards, that's a ventilating class. You can take that. If you want to learn how to do trauma makeups, you can take that. If you want to learn how to just put on all the different prosthetics, you can come and do that. We have sculpting classes, we have mold making classes, we have maquette uh, sculpting classes. So there's all kinds of stuff. That sounds like a future model for education in my book. That's yeah, incredible. It is. Wow. It's going to be, uh, I, we like it because all the classes are small. So it's like I can't really teach more than eight people at once and give them the attention that they need because by the time I get to the end of the room, I got to turn right back around and go back to the beginning of the room to make sure that everybody's you know, doing what they should be doing or they're on the right page and everything, but it's really fun. So they're really, um, you know, hands-on classes with me. And we don't, and the students don't work on each other, which is what they usually do at schools. We have models. 
So you can either bring your own model or we'll supply you with a model. And most of them are guys out of acting school. So they're really good at emoting and like if they're doing character stuff, they're really good when they take the pictures. We do really great pictures at the end so that everybody has a great portfolio range because a lot of people don't have good shots for their portfolios. So when they come to the class, we make sure that everybody has great shots for their portfolio. And it's a win-win for the actors because they get shots for their portfolios as well. So there was a question right out here. Uh huh. Um, it can. In that case, it did not because what they did was they made it look like their awful monster that they made instead of my beautiful makeups that were so they were gorgeous makeups, and they put this sketchy, weird. It looked like they had oatmeal all over them. I don't know, green oatmeal. It was like, what is that? I mean, that's not, I didn't do that, you know? But, I mean, it can, like, when we did Pirates, for instance, uh, for instance um, like Bootstrap Bill, I worked really closely with ILM, and they would come in and they would enhance little pieces of Bootstrap Bill, like he'd be spitting something or whatever. And they also, um, Joel Harlow did those makeups on Bootstrap Bill, and Crash McCreary designed them. And... Um, so when we were doing the makeups, uh, uh, John Knoll from ILM came down and he was studying the makeups that we were doing. So when he went back to go do Davy, we were going to do Davy Jones part makeup and part uh, CGI and we decided to keep them all CGI. So John came down and looked at the makeups we were doing on Bootstrap Bill and what he did was he textured those makeups so that when he went to go do all the uh, uh, Davy Jones and all those characters, they looked like our makeups. So that's why they look so good. Like on the second movie, I was, I was blown away. I, w I was looking at those makeups going, oh my God, look at Davy Jones. Oh my God, it looks so good. You know? And, and, uh, uh, Bill Nye. No, yes. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he knew what he was going to look like. So he knew how to move. He would move the head. So he knew that things were going to be flying around and stuff. So it was really cool. You could still see him through the CGI, you know, because they did such a great job. But um, I remember the first time I saw it, I was just absolutely blown away at how good the CGI looked. And funny, it didn't look that good in the next one because they didn't take the time to really make it perfect like they did in the second one. But yes, CGI is really good at enhancing makeups. The thing about CGI is I think it should be used for removal, not to add stuff on if they don't have to. If we can do it practically, it's always much better. And the actors like it because, they, for instance, um, Bootstrap Bill was only supposed to be a makeup for the first three changes that he went through, and he went through like eight changes. And he asked us if we could make, make makeups for him for the whole thing, so that he didn't have to be CGI'd. So we did. And by the end of the movie, he was like, had all that on him. He was like weighed down with all the makeup and the stuff. And, and he, it, he said it helped him act, you know, so he could feel what it was like to be in all that. So the actors like it. I mean, Look at Johnny Depp. He loves to be in makeup. He'll put anything on. He doesn't care. He, I mean, you know, he'll wear whatever he wanted to wear. He's great, you know. But it really is uh, an enhancement for the actors. But like a per perfect example of how CGI could be used. Well, then it was like green screen. It wasn't even CGI. But I did a film called AI. And Stan Winston's group, they created these really clever ways to do uh, feature removal. Like, instead of doing a prosthetic that changed the person's face, they made prosthetics that would enable the um, technicians to remove part of their faces. So it was, a, it was a prosthetic glued onto the face. It had a raised edge and in, an insert with green screen. And then this blended on the face so that you couldn't see what it was. It still looked like a perfect face, but it was a prosthetic so that they could remove that part of that face, like the, the, the nanny with the, that only had the front, she had a whole green screen thing on, um, the chef. I mean, all these guys, I was just looking at those pictures the other day. It was an incredible uh, thing that he did. I mean, his technology was amazing. And then, like, another thing that Stan did that was so cool was when we were on Galaxy Quest, the Sarah's character, which I did that makeup too, um, he had um, this really neat technology that was inside the muzzle of the, the mask, the mouthpiece, so that the actor could actually move the lips with this thing that he had so he could move his tongue and make the mouth move. Just, you know, really cool stuff that nobody had ever done before. So he was really 
Stan was really ingenious as far as like coming up with new contraptions that would make everything work better, you know? So he was cool. I liked working with Stan. Well, yeah, I love Stan Winston. Uh, so there was a question at the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. So, who went in that dance off between you and Ray Nicotero? <laughs> what were I did you six before the odds? Who, who would win between myself and Greg? Yeah. It would depend on what the challenge was. Well, dealer's choice. Well, I'm, I'm not choosing. I'd have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would think it would be the, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who'd win. It would, if it was zombies, he'd win hands down. I, I don't do zombies, so. <laughs> Well, uh, I just wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I didn't ask about one of the greatest comic book movies of all time, Batman Returns. Uh, any memories from that? That film? oh, tons. Danny was terrific. I he was so amazing. I think one of the funniest stories is like when we were doing that scene where he's walking downstairs and he's eating that fish. Well, that was real fish. That was it wasn't you know gelatin made up to look like fish. He just said, oh, well, just get me some, like, you know, sushi. Get me some salmon sushi or whatever it was. Well, Danny was regretful about that because he ate that stuff for, like, hours. <laughs> and he smelled so bad. <laughs> and I had to be right up in his face fixing him all the time, right? It was like, oh, my God. And he keeps saying, V, I'm going to barf. V, I'm going to barf. <laughs> But it was like so nasty that he had that. But it was so much fun that that set. And then oh oh oh, and uh, Christopher Walken, who is like just a damn dream. He's like so cool. He's the coolest guy ever. I begged him to dance for me <laughs> because he is such a great dancer. And I had worked for a minute on Pennies from Heaven, I think it was, where he does the dance on the bar. Oh my God! And I was like. I was on the set that day, and I was like looking and going, oh, my God. So anyway, I had already done a Western for, with Christopher. was like my very first location movie ever, like in the 70s. And he was like 19. I don't know what the, how old he was. He was young, too. He wasn't 19, but you know what I mean? He was really young, too. And uh, so the next time I worked with him was on Batman. And I said, please, you don't have to do it in front of anybody. Would you just do it for me out to the side somewhere? He goes, yeah, okay. So he did a little dance routine for me. It was so good. I was so excited. I was like losing my mind. It was oh so God. cool. Wow, that's so cool. But yeah, Batman was fun. And plus, I got to make up Paul as the father, the Penguin's father for All that. Right. So that was really neat. Oh God, yeah. that's been so so much fun. So uh, you must be one of the only people who worked on the Burton and Schumacher era Batman films, I believe, right? Yeah, I was. Yeah. So how was that? You know, any any you know transition? Was it um, much different well, doing know, it for Joel? It, it really wasn't because I'd already worked with Joel for several films, you know, and I really loved Joel, and I'd done movies with Tim too. So it was just a different aesthetic. It went back to it went from being really really dark to more like comic booky, you know, and silly and stuff. And Joel was really good at that. And Joel was really fun because Joel let me do whatever I wanted to, basically. You know, and by then we were doing stuff with, um, you know, uh, Rick Baker was designing the makeups like Two Face and and the Riddler and stuff. And we so we got to you know coordinate with that, and that was really a nice thing working with Rick again. And um, but Joel was really fun. I mean, you know, we got to do all those cool things with all those day glow characters, like you know, even in, like in the alleyway. And then, you know, he said, just do whatever you want to be. He says, like, talk to wardrobe, see what they're doing. So we, we went to wardrobe and we figured out what those guys were wearing. And then we designed makeups that went with their wardrobes. And back then we were using the Dayglow paints you couldn't see. So you had to, we had to make them up in black light. So we had black lights installed, black light bars installed in, in the makeup trailer so that the makeup artists could work with the makeup. Because back then the only stuff that you could get that really worked was, it was like, clear you know so you had to like see it under the lights to see what you were doing so that was really an interesting thing but it was really fun we had all kinds of cool stuff and then you know we did all the circus people and we painted guys gold and i mean we had it all going on you know wow. it was it was a trip wow that's amazing so uh question right here oh, john travolta. travolta i never worked with john travolta 
No, oh. no, that's the movie Face oh, Off. Right. Okay, okay. I have met John Travolta several times, but I've never worked with him. My girlfriend did his hair for like many, many years. But. Um, so we have time for just one more, guys, before we wrap it up. One, oh, well, here we go. For what? There is no such thing. There is no such thing. Okay, if you're doing foam latex and you want to use rubber mask grease paint, Tuttle, which is now the great can of makeups, that's the only one to use. Because you can thin it out with alcohol and it's not greasy. Um, PPI for your, you know, illustrator inks. I love those for effects stuff. Um, Mel makes great Pax paint. If you're working with foam latex and you need Pax paint, you don't have to make it anymore. He makes kits that are really fun. Um, but PPI makes like an incredible line of all kinds of stuff. So, you, I mean, you get your adhesives, you can get everything from them. I mean, I know there's EBA. I, I, have, I don't really work with EBA because you can't tell what the colors are. So it kind of throws me for a loop. There's also Bluebird, the guys from Australia, that make some incredible products as well. So, you know, if you're talking about effects stuff, it would have to be something specific, but I could tell you what I like to use. I could give you a list at another time. <laughs> So we got a little preview of the uh, the Venial School of Makeup here today. I love it, yeah. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So guys, show her how grateful you are by giving a great big round of applause. So, what are we going to do tonight, Brain? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Watch fandom spotlight videos and then take over the world. Hey, God, that's great. And maybe we should tell them all to have fun? And follow their fandom. Then, bow before my genius.